can't help but think there's another song that's a companion to that one that we just heard at General Conference. I've intended to get the words so that our praise singers can sing it. And part of it that I remember is I'm not going back. I'm not going back. <laughs> I have no desire to go back there. I don't intend to go back. Never going back. Praise God. I'm going to walk with him. Praise God. Romans chapter 12 today. We appreciate you so much. Continue to be in prayer. A number of those that we've been praying for, as we have mentioned, our son-in-law is uh, experiencing some difficulties. And they're going to have to do an upper GI to see what's happening. They're not sure whether it's an infection or what after his surgery. Keep him in your prayers if you would. And then... I don't see Kate here this morning. Let's continue to pray for Kate Graham, trying to help work out that situation. The other things that we've been praying for, I believe that God has something for us. I want to try to bring something to you today, some verses of Scripture that are very familiar to a lot of folks. Romans chapter 12, um, I allude to them quite a bit. Um, but I, I guess thinking a lot more about the message that Brother Gleason preached at General Conference. I didn't realize it whenever I felt impressed of the Lord to bring this to you. I've never used these verses of Scripture as a text before. The first two verses of Romans chapter 12. But I felt impressed this week to, to preach from this. The Lord just really opened my heart and my spirit to it. And uh, looking forward to great things that God's doing. It's going to take something on our part. Praise God. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to read it first of all in the NIV. Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And then, of course, I believe they have the King James up on the screen here. We know those words so wonderfully that we have heard so many times. God bless you. You may be seated today. I don't have a title for this today, but I want to, for just a little bit, talk to you about something from the Word of God here. Paul says, I beseech you. I beseech you. In other words, he was pleading. He was almost begging, if you will. But then, as the NIV says, I exhort you. And the Scripture tells us, Paul writing to Timothy, he said, Till I come, give attendance to exhortation, to reading, and to doctrine. Exhortation is trying to encourage, it's trying to uh, admonish, it's trying to bring people to a place where they can hear and understand and accept what the Word of God is trying to say. And then the second verse when he says, be not conformed to this world, and uh, the uh, NIV there talks about the pattern of this world. And I suppose this is a part of what got a hold of me and got my attention because over the past several days and several weeks now in, in various situations that I've seen and that I've been involved in personally, I, I see people who allow themselves to become patterned after the world, patterned after the things of the flesh. And I have prayed, God help me, that I don't let the pattern of the world. I know that most all of us probably understand what patterns are, my mom used to be quite the seamstress, and uh, uh, she made most of my brother and I shirts when we were growing up from feed sacks that we bought feed to feed the chickens with, and, uh, and so she could take a feed sack and make me a shirt, and she did a lot of the sewing. If she was going to make herself a dress, uh, she would have Dad be sure to get three feed sacks uh, of the same pattern and so forth because she would take those feed sacks and she would then uh, make a dress out of them because she had patterns. You know, you've seen the tissue patterns, the tissue paper patterns. 
Am I too old for that? If some of you, you know, okay. Brother, Brother Sexton this morning asking about who knows about the cathedrals and some of the others. You know, I, I saw there were only about two or three of us that had any idea who they were. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, she would take that cloth and she'd lay it out on the table and then she'd put that pattern. She'd lay it out in various ways on there so that she could get all of the things, the, you know, the front and the back and the skirt and the arms and the sleeves, you know, and all of that. And then she'd take pins and pin it together and then she could cut it out and then sew it together. Well, I believe today that God has a pattern for us. And in looking at these verses of Scripture, something that, that I felt very powerfully in my own spirit, and I, I don't know uh, whether some of this I've heard somewhere else or not, but it came to me very forcefully, I believe it was Friday morning, and I wrote this down and made this note to be sure, and I'm going to read it to you the way it came to me, that it is impossible to live for God only intellectually. The transformation of the Holy Ghost involves the whole person, body, soul, and spirit. You cannot just live for God in your mind. Now, I know, I am aware that there are those in our world today that would like for that to be so. They would like to think that they are really living for God because they have made a public confession that I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ but the rest of their life is totally opposed to the Word of God. They only have an intellectual understanding of the Word of God. They only have an intellectual concept of God somewhere. But somehow or other, they failed to understand the true pattern that God has for us today. Because Paul here is admonishing when he says, you've got to present your whole being, if you will. You present your body a living sacrifice. You've heard me say this time and time again, God is not looking for martyrs today. Amen. Some people say, well, you know, I'm willing to die for him. Well, if you're really willing to die for him, then you really need to die, not in the flesh in terms of the physical, but you need to crucify the old man and bring it into conformity to the pattern that God has laid out in his word. Amen. Because I'm convinced that if all people have is an intellectual understanding of the things of God, there's going to come a time when God is going to expect more of you than just your intellect, and the world is going to require more of you than just your intellect. There's going to have to be a total and complete sellout and commitment to the things of God. You see, I find in the Scripture and in looking at the day in which we live, and I think it's already been alluded to in this service today, but the day in which we live, the Lord Jesus Christ is about to come. And the Scripture points out to us in terms of people living for God and so forth, said if you cannot run with the footmen, how will you contend with the horses? And then what will you do at the swelling of Jordan? If we cannot live for God today, if we cannot totally live after the pattern that God has brought today, there is a time that's coming that is going to be even more difficult to live for God. And then there is going to be that final awesome time that if we don't have a true Holy Ghost-filled, born-again experience with Jesus Christ, we will not make it because our mind can only take us so far. I don't care how smart you are today. It matters not how brilliant you are today. Your mind can only take you so far because we have got to have the power of the Holy Ghost. You've heard me say it. I'll say it again today. I cannot live for God because I do not have the power. I do not have the strength, but it takes the power of the Holy Ghost. That's why I love the Word of God. When Paul said, I live, yet not I, but it is Christ that liveth within me. Somehow we've got to find, oh, hallelujah. We've got to find that place where Jesus Christ totally lives with inside of us. And as I begin to consider this, I couldn't help but think of some of the things that we've heard. And, and a part of what you're going to hear today is uh, some things that I heard at conference. Some of you that were in the leadership class last week, Brother Moody talked a little bit about a, a couple of these things. I didn't realize it as I was putting it together. But Jesus made disciples. Why? Because they followed his discipline or his teaching. And I thought of it in the academic world and sometimes elsewhere, you hear the word discipline. It's often used. 
discipline. You follow this discipline. I follow that discipline. Well, if we are going to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, we have got to follow his discipline. And what is a discipline? It's teaching. Amen. I said it's teaching. And I believe today that the Lord Jesus Christ has taught us. You see, his word tells us, uh, Jan, or Titus tells us in chapter 2, I believe it is, along about verse 11. <coughs> Pardon me. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. Everybody say teaching. teaching. Say, I am teachable. I am teachable. Ooh, Lord. That means you should be ready to receive what I'm going to tell you today. You see, if we cannot receive teaching, there's something wrong with our experience with God because none of us ever get to the place where we're so smart we know it all. And, of course, somebody said a long time ago, how dull it must be to know everything. Of course, I don't know. I've, I've, known, I've known a few folks that felt like they knew it all. And I thought, what a dull life. It's exciting to get up every day and to to think, what can I learn today? What can I find brand new today? And this is the thing about the Word of God. I have been preaching this gospel for well over 50 years now, and still when I begin to read the Scripture, when I begin to try to prepare a message, most often there is something that is, that's brand new that all of a sudden I say, wow, I never saw that before. Amen. Or I never saw it that particular way before. You see, there's something alive about the Word of God, and we need to recognize that that is the thing that will transform us. There must be that transformation that demonstrates to all those around us that we not only have a profession. You see, so many people want a, just simply a profession. Hello. You know, they, they like to go to Romans where Paul said that, you know, with the mouth confession is made, with the heart man believeth unto repentance. Well, I like that because I believe we need to profess Jesus Christ in our life. But we need to have more than just simply a profession. You know, there's a lot of folks that can talk a good story. And you can, you can refer this to uh, quite a number of things. You know, I mean, uh, <clears throat> guys, some of us were known to have a pretty good story when we were chasing the girl. Huh? And girls, sometimes some of you had a pretty good story, a backstory as well. But when it came time to, uh, to follow up on what you supposedly was able to do, it just wasn't there. You know, that, I've seen people that, man, they look like they had all the strength in the world. And, oh, boy, they are so strong. But when it came time to lift the weights, they really didn't have it. Huh? And the same thing is true. There are some people that claim that they are a child of God, but when it comes to demonstrating that they are a child of God, it just doesn't show up. They can talk a good story. They can talk a good line. But I want you to know today, I believe that God is looking for someone that has more than just simply a profession, but that we have a possession. And not only do we have a possession, but we are possessed by the Holy Ghost. And I know that a part of what we preach from the standpoint of the, the infilling of the Holy Ghost is considered totally, you know, irrelevant by as much of the world. Other people in the world think that it's not for us today. There are those in the world that think that we're crazy. And sometimes we're called fanatics. I don't know if you've ever been called a fanatic or not, but I have embraced the term. And some of you have heard me say this. The reason I have embraced it because one definition of a fanatic is someone who is convinced they're right. Are you convinced the Word of God is true today? I said, are you convinced the Word of God is true today? If you are convinced the Word of God is true, then you are a fanatic by much of the world's description because much of the world thinks that that book is mythical or it's mythological, whichever term you want to use. Or that, well, it was just, uh, you know, ideas. I'm glad today that I've got more than just a man's idea. 
praise God. You see, because somewhere along the line, God began to work inside my heart, and I began to realize that it was going to take more than me just having a good story. It was going to take more than me just having a profession. It was going to take more. You see, because I grew up in and around the church. My grandmother prayed. My grandmother was quite something in the church there where we lived in East Texas. My parents came into the church, and I went to church all the time because they said I had to. <clears throat> And so I was a good little boy. You see, I had the profession, but I didn't have the possession. Amen. Amen. Oh, everybody thought that I was, I was just great. But you see, they didn't see me once I got on the school bus and started to school. They didn't, they didn't hear the way I talked when I was away from mom and dad. They didn't see the way I conducted myself. See, some of you understand what I'm saying today. You know, around mom and dad, oh, man, I was a good guy. Around people in the church, I was great. I did everything that I was asked to do. But when I got away, then life was totally different. You see, there's a difference in profession. There's a difference in, can I say it this way, reputation and character. See, what God wants to do is put a character in us that changes our whole being, that makes us different from what we used to be, that changes the pattern of our life. I know we can kind of laugh about it today, but when I was growing up, you know, uh, the guys always, always were, oh, they wanted, to make, they wanted hair on their chin and hair on their chest. Nobody wanted, nobody wanted to shave the, the hair off their face because that was they were getting to be a macho. And man, if you were a teenager and you had hair on your chest, ha <laughs> ha, you were something else. Well, I don't anymore, but when I had hair up here, I had hair from here to here, front and back. I still have it from here down. So I guess you know, when, when I got away from home, it was none of this buttoned up shirt stuff. Friend, when I got on the school bus in the morning, the first couple of buttons come undone because I wanted all the other guys to see, man, I got a hairy chest. Now, you laugh at that, but that's, you know, I mean, that's been 60 years ago. Now, what is it today? <coughs> I couldn't believe it. I walked into a store the other day, my wife and I did. And I could not believe that the management of that store would allow what I saw. And I'm not about to try to demonstrate it, but I'm going to tell you. But there was a young man standing at the bagging groceries. And he had his apron on and so forth. And he was, you know, he was representing the company. But when I walked past the register and I turned and looked back, I could see his underwear above the top of his pants. Well, that was the first time that my wife and I have ever been in that store. We may go back, we may not. But I told her when we walked out, I said, if I was a regular customer in that store, I would have gone to the manager and said, is this what you want representing you? Now, I've just preached you a big message right there in those few words. What does our world see when they see us? Do we truly represent the pattern of Jesus Christ, or are we representing the pattern of our world? God called us out of the world. God wants us to be different from the world. Paul said, I beseech you, present your body, your whole body, mind, soul, and spirit to be an example of Jesus Christ. And somehow or other, when people begin to try to pattern themselves after the world, something is wrong with their experience in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, glory to God. I'm standing flat-footed. I said it. Amen. If we try to pattern ourselves after our world, if we try to look like our world, come on, I'm preaching to us today. If we try to look like our world, if we use the language of our world, the Scripture says, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Every idle word is going to be brought into judgment. How do we speak? What language do we use? Do we talk about Jesus? You see, when we become a disciple of Jesus Christ, we want to begin to follow his pattern. 
And as I, I thought of this, that the true child of God follows and is molded into a new and a different pattern. What does the Word of God say? Old things pass away, and behold, all things become new. I'm a new creature in Jesus Christ. I don't look like I used to look. I don't act like I used to act. I don't talk like I used to talk. I don't go where I used to go. I'm not what I used to be, thank God. Hallelujah. And as I said earlier, I don't plan on going back. Hallelujah. Because the power of God, we sang about it. Amen. They sang about it just a little bit ago. That power of God has transformed and has taken totally and changed. As I thought of this, I thought of several different ones. The 12 disciples, Paul the apostle. Friend, I'll tell you what, they were different fellows. Some of them were fishermen. Some of them were different. Other than what Matthew was a tax collector. Man, how, how obnoxious is that? <laughs> Come on, we might as well admit it, you know. But Jesus changed them. And Paul himself calls himself a blasphemer. Think about it. Paul said, you know, I persecuted the church. I did all of these things. I thought I was doing God's will. In other words, he was deluded by tradition into thinking that the pattern in which he was walking was pleasing to God. What we've got to come to realize is that God has set a pattern and a mold for his church that is different from anything else that we've ever known. You see, tradition said this, tradition says that, but the Word of God says you've got to be born again. There's got to be a transformation, not just a change of mind, not just a turning over a new leaf, but there's got to be something that turns us around and sends us on a totally different uh, path in life. I'm where I'm at today because God turned me around. See, I was headed in the wrong direction. Oh, yeah, I wanted to do this, and I wanted to do that, and there's a number of other things that I wanted to do. But Jesus said, no, I want you to do this. But Jesus, I don't want to do that. Jesus, I want to do it my way. I want to go my way. I want to do what I want to do, but yet I want to be a child of God. And I came to realize that I couldn't live for God just in my mind. And that's when I began to focus on these verses of Scripture, and that's why I've used them time and time again, that Paul says, be conformed, not conformed to this world, but be transformed. You see, we need, to, we need to make sure that we're doing the right thing. I found a quote several days ago when I was preparing the lessons that I taught or started teaching this past Thursday. And by the way, thank you for your prayers. Continue to pray. The next two Thursdays we'll be teaching in Finland via the Internet. And uh, I've gone back and I'm using what I taught in Philippians and adding just a little bit to it to try to make it appropriate for them. But I found a, a quote from a, a, an old-time preacher uh, quite an author. I think he wrote about 30 books. His name was Scroge, W. Graham Scroge. Perhaps you've heard of him. Perhaps you haven't. He died in 1958. But uh, he said this. He said, let us ever seek to do the right thing in the right way, at the right time, from the right motive, and then what we do will certainly be right. You see, sometimes people want to do the right thing but they've got an ulterior motive. Sometimes they want to do the right thing, but they do it in the wrong way. You know, that's why the Scripture says that we need to speak the truth in love. And that's why when I try to preach, I, I want people to know Jesus loves you. It doesn't matter what sin you've committed. Yes, he hates sin. I said he hates sin, but he loved the sinner. And somehow our world has got to understand because they think that when we talk of, against sin, when we talk about God going to destroying sin, they think that we're speaking hatred toward people. No, we're not speaking hatred toward people. It doesn't matter what sin you've committed. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how far you've gone from God. And all you've got to do is look at this simple preacher that's standing before you today, and I'm an example of someone that went a long, long, long way from God. But by the mercy of God, I stand before you today, a sinner saved by the grace of God. Amen. You see, we've got to come to realize that, that God wants us to do the right thing at the right time with the right motive. And he is then able to bring us into a relationship with him that will totally transform us, that will make us something that can bring glory to him. That's what it's all about. It's not about bringing glory to me. I recognize I am nothing today without the Spirit of God. 
That's why I've said before, I can't live for God. I've got to have the Spirit of God. It's Jesus Christ that lives within me. I can't do what I'm doing even right now without the Spirit of God. I know you don't believe it, but I'm very shy and reticent and just don't like being in front of folks. But when the Holy Ghost begins to move, then I can stand up here and <laughs> I can tell you what the Word says. Praise God. And I love it. I love it because it does something to me as well. Now, I don't do this just because I want it to do something to me, but God's given me a love for people that I never had before. You see, I grew up with a lot of hatred, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things in my life that weren't right. I grew up with a lot of that stuff, but the Lord took it out. He changed my whole concept, changed my whole perception of life, and caused me to realize that, that there's a lot of other folks in this world that they need to know Jesus. And if somehow I can present to them the Word of God, if I can present to you the Word of God, if I can help you in your walk with God, then that's what it's all about. Praise God. I think of some of the places, and I can't quote it exactly. I don't have it in my notes here, but, but Paul points out, and he said, you know, it does my heart good. And I'm paraphrasing it in my phraseology. He said, does my heart good when I know that you're doing well? Does my heart good when I know that, that things are going well with you? Amen. You see, there's something about it that when I can look out and I can see the growth in people's lives, and some people sometimes are slower to grow than others are. You've got children, you understand. You know, there's no way that you can say every child at six months has got to be this size, and every child at a year has got to be this size, and every child at uh, two years has got to be this size, or they've got to be walking at this time. There's some children that walk in at six, seven months. There's others that don't walk until they're 14, 15 months old. They're all different. And you know what? Every last one of us are the same way. <laughs> We're all different. Some of us are tall and some of you are short. Some of us are pretty and some of us are ugly. Some of us are pretty ugly. But Jesus loves us all. I said Jesus loves us all. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter where you've come from. You see, he brings us in and he makes us all of one blood. <coughs> As I was teaching this past Thursday online, I looked at the pictures of the various ones that were on there. And, uh, of course, there was the, the missionary's daughter. She's American, but her husband is Swedish. There was one Filipino family. There's another fellow that I couldn't quite determine exactly what he was. He's a little darker skinned. Uh, I don't know where he's from, but, but he was there. And then there was uh, another lady who is uh, from Finland. And then there was another family. I didn't see their picture, but I saw their name. It's an indication that they're from one of the Nordic countries, but I'm not sure that they're, they're from Finland. And I thought, God, look what you're doing bringing people together. Brother Moody has already mentioned it here today. You see, when God begins to bring us together, we change. We become a part of his family. And when we become a part of his family, we want to be like him. And the way that happens is because our mind gets changed because we submit ourselves. You see, you find in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, Paul says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. What do you think about? What does our mind dwell on? Does our mind dwell more on whether the patriots are going to win today or whether we're going to have a good service? Huh? You know, I, I saw something, and, and I, I look at Facebook several times a week just to kind of scroll down through some things, just look and see what's going on. I can't stand too much of it. Some of it is so inane, so banal that it's just, God. People post crazy things about their life, and I'm thinking, what? But folks have gotten all upset because something that, I don't know what John Farrell did with the Red Sox. And somebody, somebody's saying, oh, he needs to lose his job. And I'm thinking, now wait a minute, didn't I hear they made the playoffs? I mean, they obviously been playing quite well, so they made the playoffs. But you see, people get so wrapped up in their idols 
Come on, I'm preaching to us today. Come on. People get so wrapped up in so many things. But God wants us to have a renewed mind. And sometimes we think, well, the preacher's telling us we need to do this and we need to do that. No, I'm telling you what the Word of God says. Whatsoever things are true, don't think on lies. Oh, I know what the other thing was that was in the back of my mind. There's a, a very popular, very popular TV series. And, and I went down through the, just because I, I said, I've got to see this. I went down through the list of the people that responded to this one particular uh, star that's leaving, uh, what's uh, NCIS, the one that, what's her name, Pauly Perrette or whatever. And oh, I mean, people, oh, the show's going to go up. The show's going to die. It can, and oh, no, I'm, I'm this. I'm, and I'm thinking, what? It's just a TV show. But it's like people's life is so wrapped up in it. I mean, yeah, it, it, you know, and I've got the, I've got the DVDs, and I like watching it, but, but hey, it's just a TV show. It's just a series, and people come and go. And really, it's all, you know, I mean, of course, it's based on truth, but, but it's just a, a story. What do we really think about? See, things that are true, things that are honest. Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things of a good report. Do we rejoice over someone else's good report? Praise God. Can we rejoice over somebody else's good report? You see, there are those, and I have, I have run into some of them in time past. Perhaps if you've been around the church a while, you probably will understand where I'm coming from and what I'm saying with this. That is that sometimes people seem to get jealous if this church over here is having revival, but they're not seeing quite the same move of God in this church. Hey, we're all part of the kingdom. Hallelujah. If somebody gets the Holy Ghost down the road, thank God for it. That's one more sinner that's been saved by the grace of God. Just because, you know, what's the old saying? And this is, this is real old. Some of you really won't know this one. But just because it's not coming out of my smokestack don't mean it ain't smoke. Now you have to stop and think about that one for a minute. But some people are jealous, man. Oh, boy, we, we did this, we had this, we had that. And, and, you know, that's why we have to be careful sometimes as a preacher. And, and I, I like to brag on you folks. But I have to be very careful because I don't want people to think, and I don't want them to get jealous of what God's doing. I want them to know, hey, if God's done it for us, he is no respecter of persons. He can do it for anybody. But, but you've got to follow his pattern. You want the blessings of God? Follow His pattern. Because that's the pattern that produces the blessing. You want that garment to fit properly? You know, my mom could not buy a petite pattern. Because my mom was not petite. She was 5 foot 8 and weighed about 180 pounds and she was just... Strong as an ox. Amen. I didn't dare cross her. Not just because Dad was standing behind her. But I knew she, is, she was capable of putting me into the middle of next week. <laughs> now, you see, so when she started to make a dress, she looked for a pattern that would fit her. And it was difficult because most of the dresses that were made just didn't quite fit her. And some of you ladies understand what I'm saying. And so she made all of her dresses. When she passed away, she had 60-something dresses that she had made hanging in her closet. She even made the dress that she was buried in. If you wanted to get her something for birthday, something for her anniversary, Dad always got her a piece of cloth. And I suppose that's where I learned, I picked it up from, what looks good, what looks good on mom, dad knew. What looks good on my wife, I know. I probably pick out the vast majority of my wife's clothes. Just, that's just the way it is. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to be that way. And, 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 and listen, and, and brethren, if you're not that way, that's fine. That's fine. 
you know, I've got a son-in-law that when, when he and my daughter first got married, used to aggravate the living daylights out of me. They'd come to our house, and they'd start to go home. And guess who's packing the car? My daughter. Guess who's doing all the suitcases? My daughter. And what's the son-in-law doing? Sitting in there with his computer. And I'm saying, son, you're making her do all of this stuff. But you know what? When it came time to clean up the kitchen, he was the first one in the kitchen. Me? Oh. Me and dirty dishwater just don't mix. So what I'm saying to you is there are some areas of life where, where we can express and we can be individuals. But when it comes to living for God, friend, there's only one pattern. Jesus said, I am the way. No man comes to the Father but by me. He said, I am the door. If you try to climb up any other way, you're the same as a thief and a robber. Praise God. You see, we've got to come to understand that God has a set pattern. God has a plan. In the days of Noah, it was the ark. There was no other place to go for salvation but the ark. Well, I don't like that old boat. Well, it doesn't matter sometimes whether you like that old boat or not. It doesn't matter sometimes whether we like the idea of repentance and baptism in Jesus' name because that kind of separates us from the world. If I go in that boat, everybody will know that I'm following uh, uh, Noah's teaching and they're going to laugh at me. Well, would you rather be laughed at or would you rather drown? Come on, folks. We, we, we've got to recognize, we've got to come to the place today because we're living in a world that is trying to mold us to its pattern. And it's trying to creep into the church. It's trying to become a part of apostolic doctrine. It's trying to change apostolic teaching. It's trying to cause us to conform to the world. And Paul said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What am I thinking about? Which way is my mind going? And then I've got to walk in the Spirit every day. You can't just live for God on Sunday. Amen. Now, I understand work situations and so forth, and I understand distance and all this, and I know that some of you can only be here on Sunday. But you can't just live for God on Sunday. You've got to walk with Him in the Spirit every day. In Galatians 5, 16, Paul said, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see, because there is a war that goes on between our flesh and our spirit. There's a war that is trying to destroy us, that's trying to bring us into conformity to its ideas. That's why there have been wars in, in, in our world in the natural, trying to bring men into a certain particular mold or into a certain type of uh, 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 economic or political situation. That's what war is all about. If I can win the war, then I can make you conform to my way of doing it. That's why the devil wars against your spirit because he's trying to get you to think like the world, trying to get you to act like the world, trying to get you to act like and be like the world. But folks, we need to remember today, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to hurry to a conclusion here, that we've got to glorify God. I'm not in this world just for Doug Chesson, but I've got to glorify him. And 1 Corinthians 6 and 20 says, For you are bought with a price. Everybody say, I'm bought. See, you don't belong to yourself. If you have repented and been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, you've been bought. Amen. You're bought. I'm, you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God just in your thoughts. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not what Paul said. He said, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. What? No, you're not. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which temple you are, which temple, you know, which spirit you have within you. We have the spirit of God within us. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, we ought to glorify God. God, help me that I don't do anything with this body that doesn't bring glory to God. Come on, praise God. God, I've got to glorify you. I've got to make sure that everything I do, every aspect of my life glorifies you. Amen. Paul, or Peter says this in 1 Peter 2.12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. 
that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of salvation. Another verse of Scripture that we use many, many times says, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. If I am just like my world, how in this world will they ever know that I'm trying to glorify God? Because, folks, I want to tell you what, the pattern of our world does not glorify God. The perverted lifestyle does not glorify God. Amen. It does not. We might as well be honest about it. It doesn't bring glory to God because, as somebody said in the beginning, he created them Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Amen. Killing innocent children doesn't glorify God. Amen. Folks, our world needs to know that we stand for the truth of the Word of God. Every life is precious in His eye. <laughs> Praise God. See, God's looking for a people that will follow His mold, follow His pattern, because only His pattern will decorate our lives in such a way that it brings glory to Him. A number of years ago, I preached a message and asked the question, who's decorating your life? You see, we need to make sure that Jesus is. First Peter 2 and 12, he says, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. Honest, honest. Are we honest in our dealing with people? That whereas they speak against you as evildoers, even though they say, oh, you're one of those. But they behold your good works, and they glorify God. You see, Paul's, I mean, all of Jesus' disciples had been a number of things, as I've already mentioned. Paul called himself a blasphemer and so forth. As you begin to look into the book of Galatians chapter 5, there you find the fruit of the Spirit. I thought of several others, and I don't have all of them written down, but Jesus said that if you love me, keep my commandments, not my suggestions. They were the ten commandments. <clears throat> I said commandments. And when Jesus was asked about it in the New Testament, What's the greatest commandment? What did Jesus say? You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. That sounds to me like total. What's left besides your mind, your heart, your soul, your strength, your body? What, what do you have left? Everything belongs to him. And then he said the second is like to it. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, but I don't like them. He didn't say you had to like them. But he said you had to love them. We may not like some of the things that people do, but we've got to love them with the pure love of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and folks, we live in a world today that is looking for somebody to care. They're looking for somebody to love them. But too many people are so set up on their own high horse, oh, I'm better than them. No, we're not. No, we're not. Just because, just because we have embraced the truth does not make us better than anyone down the street. And I've been having to deal with some folks in time past. They, you know, they, they get kind of hard. Well, I believe the Word of God is true, and I believe we've got to obey it. But the Word says, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. You know, I'm not going to walk up to somebody and slap them upside the head and say, Bless God, you're going to hell. They may be going to hell because their lifestyle the way they're living is not pleasing to God. They may be going to hell, but I'm not going to win them to Jesus Christ by trying to slap them down and trying to stuff it to them. You know, I thought of it even this morning. I like, I really love coconut cream pie. Hint, hint. But I don't like it slapped in my face. Huh? Come on. The Word of God is so beautiful and so precious and it's so sweet and so tender, but nobody likes it slapped in the face. You see, the Scripture says, He that winneth souls is wise. Now, if we had a house full of visitors and a house full of folks here today that never sought the Holy Ghost and so forth, I'd preach this just a little bit different. But, but since we don't, I'm preaching to us right now. Folks, I want to tell you something. We need to make sure 
that what we give to people, we give it to them gently and with love and with compassion. You know, Our neighbor, we've been talking with them and just recently, and, and I've been trying to be very careful because I want to win them. They see how we've lived for the last three years we've been living there. We've had conversations with them from time to time. We've been talking with them about a Bible study, and I think we're just about to get one started. You say three years? Yeah. Sometimes it takes patience. Everybody's not going to jump on the bandwagon the first time you come around. And so I try to be very, very prudent with what, what, what I talk with him about and how I discuss some things with him. But we were talking recently, and we're talking about salvation and so forth. And finally, just the other day, he said, he said, man, said, I've had to repent. And inside, you know, I mean, he said, I said, what's that? But inside, I said, whew, come on, hallelujah. He's heading in the right direction if he's ready to repent. If he's already repenting, he's going in the right direction. You know, I mean, man, I could have jumped up and down and shouted. So, so in talking with him, uh, we were talking about some things he was interested in the end time. So I took a couple of the old end time magazines I had. And I said, here, well, this will give you a little bit of insight into some of the things that are happening that are going to happen. And I hesitated, but I, I went ahead and gave it to him. So then a week or so later, I asked him, I said, hey, you had a chance to read those magazines? He said, yes, said they scared me to death. Now, you see, I knew that there were things in there that would, would really begin to get him to think about some things. But I, I had to say, God, if it's that time, and I felt that it was, and so it, it seems to have worked in his advantage, because now he's saying, I've repented, because I know there's something inside of me. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to the day we see them here, and I get to baptize them in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, I already see it by faith. Amen. I believe it's going to happen because there's something there. And when we will be what God has asked us to be, we have not pounded on them. We have not tried to, you know, and, and I've talked to someone just recently. And, and oh, man, a lot. You know, it, it's like the individual that they were dealing with was just, hey, you can pray. I had someone here recently say, oh, I don't know whether they trusted our prayers. They were talking about somebody that supposedly is a child of God. See, in other words, this person has presented themselves in such a way that, that, that family members sometimes even think, do they trust our prayers? Do they think that we can pray? See, we need to be careful. We need to follow his pattern. Jesus never came to this world to condemn. If you bring condemnation to someone, You've done it wrong. Now, if you cause them to be convicted, then you've done it in the right spirit. And there is a difference, and I don't have time to go into that. And on and on we can go to the various things. Love one another. Love your brother. Pray for one another. For by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. You have love one for another. Pray one for another. When you see somebody hurting, pray for them. Pray for them. Don't put them down. Don't try to figure out what it is you can peck on them. And then he said to forsake not the assembling yourselves together as a matter of some is. I've already said I understand some things in terms of people being in church, but folks, we need to be in the house of God every chance we get. I heard someone say a number of years ago that they are of a mind that God's going to hold some people accountable for messages they could have heard that they did not make it to church to hear. I don't know. Then, of course, in our giving, giving tithes and offerings, you see, God set a pattern. And how can you expect the blessings of God if you don't follow the pattern. God has blessed us. And I know sometimes when God begins to bless and, and the church begins to get some funds, people say, well, they don't need my money, so I just don't give. Hey, uh-uh, uh-uh. Because the more you give, the more he's going to give back to you. That's right. Amen. And I'll say it very plainly today. If you're not paying your tithes, you're not following God's pattern. Amen. That's, that's God's pattern. He said, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. Prove me. He said, I'll pour you out a blessing. Malachi 3 gives both the blessing and the curse. He said he'd rebuke the devourer. Folks, I'll tell you what, you can't outgive God. And, and somehow the God has helped us over the last eight years to prove that to you in this church. Some of you that have been here for quite a while, you have seen what God has done with the finance because we have given outside our doors. 
I think I made a mistake uh, in quoting or made a misquote the other day because I added a little bit more. Uh, I think that my number that I gave a couple of weeks ago before we went to conference should have been around 110,000 instead of 120 because I added the CD certificate onto the end, but it was included in the other. Well, we've got more money today than we had last year, more money than we had the year before. And folks, we've, we've totally redone the whole outside. We've totally redone all of our platform microphones and speakers and stuff. We've totally re repainted everything and, and, and all these things that we've done. And we've got more money in the bank than we had when we started. Now, you tell me, and, and, and we've given over 50-something thousand, and I took $5,000 to, to the general conference with me in faith because we had about $6,100 pledged for I Am Global. And then the Holy Ghost began to work there. And some of you heard me the other day when I, I man, I, I'll be honest with you. I, God, we've already pledged 5000 Now I've got to go home, and, and the preacher said, double it. And I turned around and walked back from the platform area and went back to the seats where we'd been sitting. And I sat down, and I took the envelope that I had the $5,000 check in. And I circled $5,000, and I put enclosed. And I looked at it, and I looked at it, and finally I put the check in. You see, I don't, I don't like to go by emotionalism. But when I feel God is moving, when I feel God is doing something, then it's time to step into it. You hear me today? I tell you, God is wanting us to step into another dimension when we will come to the place where we are more than just intellectual Christians. And I've got the question here today. Do you really want to be? And do you intend to be a true Christian and disciple of Jesus Christ? Of course, Jesus said in John 3, you've got to be born again. Matthew 28, Jesus gave them the instructions. Acts chapter 2, Peter reiterated the instructions, explained it. Repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, receive the Holy Ghost. Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other name. Romans 8 and 9, if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. Romans 8 and 11, if you don't have that Spirit, you're not going to go in the resurrection. then I put in all caps here in my notes today with Paul I beseech you I implore you I exhort you to begin your journey to become a true Christian by moving into the dimension of discipleship to the Lord Jesus Christ present yourself to him let's stand he shut the bus of the bus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Love him today, folks. Praise God. Love him today. Praise the Lord. Love him today. Hallelujah.